get a population that was swelled by visitation. So we recently decided to reverse that. We have declared San Antonio, Texas, and portions of Minnesota to be colonies of Port Aransas. <laughs> There's so many special people here that I'm going to put them in groups, you know, great big groups. Will all the folks that work for the museum please raise both your hands, look in the back. Can we please have a big hand? Amongst those notable presences, we have a lady that put together and runs our docent core, without which we would be nothing. We have uh, two of the members of our fundraising team that just set a world historical record for <laughs> fundraising in Port Aransas in one night. When the museum had its auction three weeks ago, we raised $82,000. If you 
you are a veteran, we want to talk to you. He came from Uvalde and Eagle Pass, on the way those are, no doubt. So he's pretty much a South Texas guy. Graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, probably because he didn't know about AM, with the BA in marketing. <laughs> oh, Bill. <laughs> he worked for some private companies for a while before he finally got the call. And now he came, he has become, he, first off, he took his master's degree in, in uh, with a focus on American military history at San Marcos. So he made up for his earlier sins by, by being too silly. And he heads up the commission's major initiative, Texas in World War II. In addition to this key project, Mr. McWhorter handles all the military history associated assignments from the state's War of Independence to Operation Desert Storm. That's a lot to say, Grace Over. Please welcome William McWhorter. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. We were here in August of last year conducting one of our oral history training workshops with the County Historical Commission and the Port Aransas Preservation and Historical Association right here in this building. I'm glad to see that we have about 10 times as many people here tonight as we did during that workshop. I was just about to say, can you dim the lights? And it looks like you're already starting to do so, so thank you. I'm going to do my best to stick with this microphone. I have a tendency to walk around and move around. But let's do a couple things first. Can everybody, especially those in the back, hear me just fine? Excellent. And second, with this laser pointer, can you see that clearly or do you need to get some more lights? All right, great. Well, the presentation's done. Thank you for coming tonight. Make sure that you leave a donation at the door. No. All right. Well, I'm here to talk to you about Texas in World War II, which is a special project our agency started as I turn the machine off which our agency started on September 2nd, 2005. Does anybody know why we would pick September 2nd? Yeah, That's correct. We picked that date because it was the 60th anniversary of the sign of the surrender in Tokyo Bay that ended the war officially. We did a celebration at the state capitol, and we kicked off a program that has four main points. First of all, the here and there oral history training workshops, which I discussed with you. What we're doing with that is we're actually conducting oral history training with various groups around the state. I'm going to get into that with some photos and a map and show you all the places we've been. I'm also going to talk to you about vignettes of wartime Texas, which is our series of undertold markers. We put 21 up across the state during this project. We've done 20, we've got one more to go, and that's to the Texas home front, which will be in Johnson County in the city of Cleveland. Is anybody from Johnson County? That's okay. You don't have to. Be. <laughs> I'm going to focus a lot on the statewide survey in this presentation because you're going to see just how much our state has changed in the past six and a half decades. And then, last but not least, I'm going to tell you how all the information that we're gaining is going to be available for free from the history buff to the public school teacher to the academic historian alike through our website when this project's done in 2011. So, what you see on here are two different publications we put out. How many people are familiar with the agency that I work at, the Texas Historical Commission? A few of you? Are any of you subscribers to our bi monthly newsletter called The Medallion? Same people that are aware of us, excellent. Well, for those of you who don't know, we put out a free newsletter, newsletter every two months called The Medallion. And we did a special World War II edition. If any of you are interested in one of those, see me afterwards and I can make one available for you. It's, of course, out of print, but I have a couple of left over in case anyone wanted to see it. What you do have on the seats in front of you or in your laps, because I saw a lot of you already open, is our theme brochure called Texas in World War II. Now, it's certainly not a complete brochure of the entire initiative because it was printed prior to its starting. And also, if we put everything into it, it'd probably be about the size of the New York City phone book. So that's why we're going on the web. But what it is, it's a nice representation of the information available at the time, which is 2003 and 2004, of available resources and known sites they were part of Texas during World War II. Now, a lot of you are probably aware of the statistics that I have up here. But with the oral history training workshops I do, we often talk to younger generations who can't fathom the fact that six and a half decades ago, our state didn't look anything like it does today. The entire population of Texas is less than that of the city of New York City, 
prior to December 7, 1941. And much of the state is a rural state. It's the urbanization that you see brought on by World War II, which changes into these major cities that we have. And of course, the 1950s highway expansion, which makes it easier to get to these places. Because as many of you who are not from our state would like to come down here, you drive a long distance to get from one point to the next in Texas. Now, this was an estimate in 2004 of the military sites in the state during World War II. Now, we focus on both military and home front sites. But this map shows you, with just a few dots, just how many sites were around the state. And one uh, characteristic that pops out to a lot of people is the fact that there was over 70 prisoner war camps in Texas during World War II. We'll give you some more detailed maps and talk to you about a few of those sites as we go along. Now, we've been doing research for the past five years. Joining me in the front row right there, just throw your hand up real quick so they can see is Laura Newcomer. She's a contract historian with a private firm working with our agency to document these, state, these sites around the state. And our research thus far has shown that of the 254 counties in the state, 193 are hosting a military or a home front site of some type during the war. And we're working with a site that's close to about 1,500 sites. I know. Now, of course, what are sites? Are they all Randolph Field, which becomes Randolph Air Force Base? Or are they as small as the coastal defenses here at Port Aransas? The answer is the latter. We're trying to document as much as we can. The auxiliary fields for our Air Force, the base camps, and their smaller branch field camps. Where was your ration board in your community? Where was your home front industry? And I'm going to give you some examples that we've been finding around the state. In addition to that, we've been noting that these sites did not exist in a vacuum. You didn't go to Valley, Texas, train on our field, and never have any interaction whatsoever with the community. And just use that example anywhere around the state, San Angelo, Bonham, Amarillo, wherever. Many cases, a local chamber of commerce, a city council person, the mayor, a state representative, a congressman, would actually seek out the military and say, look, we want this site here. Whether it's a POW camp or an army training field, if it's a naval installation, we want it. Because why? Because Texas, much like all the other states in the Union, has been dealing with the Great Depression for 10 years, and they would like to have this kind of installation here. Now, let's talk about a few of those. In the next few slides, you're going to see this one in the top right here. These are different installations that you can see the difference in what six and a half years, sorry, six and a half, six and a half decades has done to these sites. Before I go on to it, how many of you like the history channel? Most of you? How many of you have seen a show called uh, Life After People? One person seen it? Well, watch it because it's pretty good. <laughs> well, you're going to see a couple of slides here and it's reminiscent of that show, how these sites, which played such a major part in our state and in our nation's history, can disappear from the collective consciousness over time. And you see that with the Texas and Korean War sites, and you're starting to see that with the Vietnam War sites. All right, here we go. This is Camp Perfect. This is a POW camp up in the Panhandle, which is about uh, a few miles south, southeast of the city of Amarillo. This is a POW camp that has Italian POWs. Now, during the war, five of their fellow comrades died while in, in Texas. One of them fell off a truck, died. One of them was actually murdered by his fellow um, captives, and a couple of them died from wounds that they suffered during combat that never recovered. Now, as you can see, and for any of you that are familiar, when you get up to our panhandle portion of the state, it's pretty flat in a lot of places. There's not a lot of landmarks, a lot of it's agriculture, and you can see that in the background of these photos, including the guard tower and the camp right there. So what the POWs did was, they're being paid a wage for working in local potato fields, doing work for the camp. They use their own money, with permission, of course, from the commander of the post, to build a chapel. They made it out of concrete, but they polished it in such a way that it looks like marble. And they used it as a marker, so they would know, you see them right here, and three to the right, where their comrades were buried. Now, after the war, they had remains were repatriated back to Italy, but the site has remained. So men like this, working up in the fields, versus of war, taken either in North Africa, Sicily, or Italy, built a site that six and a half decades later is still there. And in August of last year, our NATO allies, the Italian Air Force from the Republic of Italy, 
along with the United States Air Force, did a rededication ceremony of the chapel. The two county historical commissions, this site sits on the border of Castro and Desmond, supply the elbow grease for public ability to provide the funding, and they were able to repair this chapel, which I have found across the state, there's not another example of. Now, I'm quite familiar with other posts in other um, states. In the state of Indiana, there's a camp called Camp Abner. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I am because of some research I've done on the World War II Infantry Division that served there during the war, the 106, the Golden Lights, the Fall of Battle of Bulge. I was going to go to their reunion last year, but unfortunately couldn't make it due to a uh, scheduling conflict. But I was lucky enough to have some of the veterans that I made contact with on their tour there send me back photos of a chapel very similar to this there. These are the only two examples I found around the United States that still exist today. But what you see from the sites that I'm going to show you is that the infrastructure laid out to support them, the sites supporting the communities, and the actual buildup of the turf, because often was the case that an Army airfield after the war didn't become an Air Force base, the city wanted it, it became a city or county airport. You see the modernization and urbanization of Texas brought on by World War II. Now there's three different levels of interpretive sites across the state. There's sites such as Randolph Air Force Base, which during the war is Randolph Field. This is in San Antonio. I'm going to use my laser pointer here for you. The city of San Antonio, which I just learned is a colony in Port Francis. Where's, where's Pratt? Is he still here? Or he? Too bad. I paid him honors to his joke and he's not here to hear. Randolph Air Force Base is northeast of town. Now this site is an active duty Air Force Base. The Department of Defense has historians on staff. It's got a National Register District. It has many preserved historic buildings. And if you went there today, if you get permission to go on base, through the base museum, through the cultural resource staff, you're going to learn a lot about what its mission was from its beginnings in the late 1930s through the present. The second level of interpretation seen throughout the state is smaller communities. A lot like you see here in Puerto Ranchers preserving their local history in one way or the other. An example I'm using here is Hearn, Texas. Hearn, Texas, and being a Longhorn, I have no problem saying this, is close to Texas A&M University. I like Aggies. My brother lost one. I've got a lot of friends. How many Aggies do we have here? Just two? Three. Okay, excellent. Well, Hearn, Texas had the benefit of being only 30 miles away from College Station. Two professors from College Station, one in the and one in archaeology, came and did an archaeological dig and historical research study of the former POW camp. Working with the County Historical Commission of the city, they set up a great museum inside of their chamber of commerce to talk about the impact of this preserved war camp in their community during World War II. And they're doing their best to preserve as much of their local World War II history that goes along with it. Because these camps would often buy supplies from local dealers. The soldiers that guarded these posts may not have stormed the beach or fought in the skies over Europe or were arena in the Pacific. But they served the job during World War II as well. And they would go into town. What was their interaction there? Well, there's a the USO. Some of them met people and settled in the community, much like that. And they're doing a great job of preserving what they have in the community. Now, you mentioned that I'm from Uvalde and Eagle Pass. Well, I was born in Uvalde, grew up on the border, it's the town of Eagle Pass. Again, San Antonio was our reference point. Down here to the border, Eagle Pass is right here. Now, growing up in Eagle Pass, I knew a little bit about the history. Fort Duncan was a cavalry post in the 1800s and armed through to right at the end of World War II and served at various degrees. But I was unaware that Eagle Pass, which like many communities from the map I showed you around our state, had army airfields. And in addition to having an army airfield, Eagle Pass being right here, the big plains army airfield, they also have satellite fields around the place. They're called auxiliary fields. And it has three, two in the county and one to the north in Kennecott. Now, why are they having these auxiliary landing fields? Well, the reason is they're training people out to be pilots. So you don't want to have all these young cadets all doing their practice right above the airspace of the field. They would send them out. And I'll give you examples of how they would send both the men and the women pilots based on the field around the state out to do their training. This is Eagle Pass in 1943. It's an advanced pilot training school. That means they're flying A6 Texas, powerful training planes. And they're also starting to fly single-engine combat planes. You can see there's quite a few planes on the tarmac back towards the right, or towards the piano, if you will, would be 
most of the posts. That's where the hangers are, that's where the barracks are, associated sites. This is what it looks like today. It is a county airport, but unfortunately, many of the World War II resources there are not extant. If you were to go there today, if you're lucky enough to find the airport manager, he can tell you a little bit about it because he has a folder in his file of people that have come back and served during World War II in the past time airfield and wanted to know a little bit more about it. But unfortunately, there's not a lot there to tell you what it is. So that's what we're doing with Texas in World War II, is we're trying to tell you what was there. Now, auxiliary fields. This is a ground view of access to an auxiliary field. If you're driving down the road and you don't know exactly what the longitude latitude coordinates are on a county road, you're not going to find the fact that this is a World War II site where pilots train. But if we use the 1945 airport directory, which gives us an aerial photo of each Army airfield and its auxiliaries around the state during World War II, now this light here may be problematic, but I'm going to use my laser pointer to help you. You can see with these red lines that I'm putting in the outline of that field. Going up like this, down like that, back around. That road where the gate is, right there. And using my great friending tool, Google Earth today, I don't know if any of you like to use it, but when we're looking at these bombing ranges around the state, I really don't want to set foot on them until the US Army Corps of Engineers has had a chance to do their mission. Interesting. This is not happening. People banging the door to get out of our presentations. Now, one of the first times I saw this photo, I immediately thought of 
Very important shit to happen. Now, in 1942, there is a scare that there could possibly be infiltration, definitely the presence of U-boats. But at the time, we didn't know if the United States was going to be invaded either on the West Coast by the Japanese or possibly the East Coast. Turns out neither of the Axis nations, Germany or, or uh, Japan, Italy, to an even lesser extent, had the resources and logistics to mount an invasion across the ocean. If they could have done that, they would have invaded Britain in 1940 as opposed to trying to do an air war. But also, as you may know, as being natives here or spending time here, sometimes it gets a little cloudy. Sometimes fog rolls in on our coast, just like it does around the, around the world. And these items, such as this one you see right here, and this next one in this photo right here, are being used by Army troops to listen and see if they hear anything that might be coming in. Because they don't know if the court might be gone, they don't know what the case may be. Plus, it's great training because of the activity taking place in Texas, I'm sorry, the Dallas and Chip Town that these soldiers can be sent overseas to help protect as the Allies move further and further across Europe, such as taking the Port of Antwerp late in 1944. Now, if we get a little closer and we talk about the mission that's happening around here, we're looking at temporary gun emplacements. Now, Governor Court was nice enough to provide us this photo that he got from another source, uh, a typical historic photo of a Panama Mount. And what you have here is a U.S. Army field artillery piece, not coast artillery, but field artillery piece, placed on to this map. Now, if we went up to Sabine Pass, where this next photo is, this is what one of those sites looked like today. You have the wheels of the artillery piece right here and the back portion here. So they have a 360 degree spin that they could use as a temporary mount for their gun. And thankfully, it's a local rope gun mount in case you didn't know what it was when you got there. But when we came here last August, we were, nice, we were treated to a very nice tour of the city. We went to various different store homes, and they also took us up into the dunes. And while the dunes, again, a photo provided by Mr. Ford showing the dig out and construction of the Panama Mount, reminiscent of what was here during the war, you can see, if I can get this slide to advance, that mount right there. There's a circular wall coming around, and back this way. They're standing on the centerpiece, and you can see how much the dune and vegetation is replanted. And that's one of at least two that I know of for the August trip. Tomorrow, we're going to be with Mr. Ford and other members of the Historical Association looking for this and other sites here in the Port Francis area. And then there's the railing. We're also going to be looking at the harbor patrol boats because you would have shipping coming in, and you have to have a way to meet those ships to find out what was their point. This is a view of what we're told from this bus that we're riding on with the Harbor Patrol Point. We're looking forward to learning a little bit more about this. I put this slide in when Guthrie was going to be here. Unfortunately, he can't tonight because of how many historical commission meetings. So we can tell us briefly what we're looking at. Now, a little bit of the Gulf Coast again. It's <laughs> something that we found that we hadn't heard of before. Now, I'm not sure if you have, but when I think of remote controlled aircraft, I think of the Cold War. I start to think, you know, more recent history. We have found evidence, thanks to the Historical Association of California County, of, of a temporary post called Camp Indianola, subpost of Camp Hewlett, that was using remote controlled aircraft to practice their coast artillery against. And they would have an amphibious jeep, drive out into the water, pick up the remains, bring it back. And we went to Fort Bliss just last weekend where the Coast Guard Artillery trained prior to being shipped out through the Cold War. And uh, they talked about drones. They actually had pieces of a drone left over in their storage um, facilities. So we got a chance to see one of those. So we're looking forward to exploring this topic more. Where else was remote controlled aircraft being used? I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, but there was the attempt to use heavy bombers with radio controlled aircraft with a lot of explosives in them to crash into a fortified position. I believe uh, Joe Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's older brother, died in a mission like that during World War II. Well, we've heard reports that up near Fort Worth, at Eagle Mountain Lake, they were practicing some of that as well. So we're looking forward to seeing if there's any of this kind of remote control technology taking place in Texas during World War II. Sorry, that is really here. We move up to uh, Corpus Christi. Am I allowed to talk about Corpus Christi here, or is it, is it bad subject? <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> when you have the coastal defenses, if something happens, it's their job to react to it. Well, who 
who's out there looking for that something to them react? We have Corpus Christi training pilots, but you also have various aspects of it that are used for patrol. Flying boat right here, PBY, that's it in 1943, and the ranch is still there today. Now, of course, they don't use those because they don't uh, use those types of planes anymore, but these ranch are still there as part of their historical complex. Go up even further, a little inland from Galveston, Hitchcock, and the same weather station. Use of, of airships. Now, of course, they're using airships well before World War II. They use them across the country. They use them in various, various aspects overseas. But here in Texas, one of the major facilities they use them. My battery's getting low here. Sorry about this. I'm going to get closer. A couple of photos. Unfortunately, uh, Portions of this site no longer exist. We're going to be uh, surveying Galveston, like I said, in May. This will be one of our sites to hit and see what resources are extant. Now, told you from Eagle Pass. We've talked about Coast Guard artillery, and Eagle Pass is on the other side of the state. So, how did we get here? Well, what's another mission they're doing on the coastal bend during World War II? Well, if we look at San Antonio, the ASI Rivers Point, we head towards Eagle Pass in the city of Laredo. If you're familiar with the geography that I'm talking about, there's a highway system, Highway 83, that takes you around this section, takes you down through the radio, all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley. Both sets of my parents went to high school in San Benito, Texas, which is down in the Rio Grande Valley. Both sets of grandparents lived in San Benito, San Benito, Texas, many years after my parents graduated from high school. So guess what? Every Easter, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, sometimes in summer, we were always going down to the valley. And I never thought, why does the road go with the border all the way up to Del Rio. And why does the road go with the border all the way down from Rio to Zapata, Rio Grande City, on down into the valley? Well, it could be many reasons. Maybe there was a landowner that didn't want a road going through his land and didn't sell uh, when they built the road system. Or maybe during World War II, there's an aerial target range there that has enough munitions left over from it. There's cruiser springs and there's the radio that it supported missions both for Eagle Pass on the airfield in the north, but also Laredo, which was training waste gunners, ball turn gunners, top turn gunners on heavy bombers during World War II. One of several sites around the state of Texas that did that kind of training. And they had the main range here, and they had another smaller range there. So, we use that as an example to talk about the coastal bend and what kind of ranges are taking place here during World War II. Well, using an example from San Angelo, you can see there were concentric circle types. Some look like ships, some look like the docks that ships might be next to. And the crazy thing about this is that, of course, out in the West Texas desert, where there hasn't been that much of a buildup of communities as there has been, say, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, you still have the land out there, and there's not been a lot of erosion. We have archaeological stewards who uh, have their own planes and they're flown over and took photos to show you what the sites look like today. But on the Gulf Coast, subject to, of course, hurricane winds, storms, erosion, moving channels, it's surprising that some of these body ranges will still be there. I'm going to show you a few that are still there. Now, Corpus Christi again, and I have permission to talk about Corpus Christi next week. Thank you. I'm going to flip this image so you can look at it better. It says Gulf of Mexico right there. It says Ligo Peninsula there. Blackjack Peninsula, St. Joseph Island. They had both on island targets and they also had floating targets. Now, I don't uh, presume to think that a wooden floating target is going to be a bath and bay six and a half decades after World War II. But look what is still there. If we move away from Corpus Christi towards the target range of Matagorda Peninsula and Matagorda Island, where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife owns a lot of land, use of Google Earth. See that circle right there? That circle right there, then the Gulf Coast, six and a half decades of erosion. I'll make it bigger for you. These sites are still there. We were actually going to go see this tomorrow. But unfortunately, the Fish and Wildlife people told us that we had to be respectful of what we bring. So we're coming back later this year to go take a look at those sites. So I don't have any great uh, information on these sites about how big they are or what they look like on the ground. But we do have an idea of how they were carved because we found some carving documents that show, I don't think they're called earth movers, but they're the heavy construction equipment that have the blade in the middle between two tires in the front and four tires in the back, and they just grind those things out. 
and they are massive. We're talking 500, sometimes 1,500 yards across, allowing both Navy and Army Air Force's pilots to do their bombing training, both here on the Gulf and throughout the state of Texas. Now, one thing we're really interested in looking at is after we did our workshop here in August, we went down and did one in Brownsville in September, and a friend of uh, Mr. Ford's told us that he's found some evidence that the Port Mansfield Channel, which is right here, city of uh, Brownsville is inland about right here, and then back borders up there, was considered as a possible site for the Trinity experiment. Trinity experiment, for those of you who don't know, being the first atomic weapon tested prior to being used against the Japanese in the Pacific. Well, there's nothing built up from that. It was looked at as a possible site. The project working on it was interested in finding out whether or not, you know, a detonation on an island system, what would the winds do with that wind? You had most of the King Ranch right there, no major cities, so a lot of that fallout that did blow in would blow into, unfortunately, the King Ranch killed a lot of animals, but it wouldn't hit Corpus Christi or Brownsville, so they fought. Well, luckily, they didn't choose to use uh, our island system as uh, the place to test either uh, Fat Man or Little Boy. But uh, we're going to look in the proper document research and do a research trip to the National Archives this year. If we find anything, hopefully, that'll be something we can share with the local historical association. Now, we're talking about Camp Indianola, Camp Indianola being a sub camp of Camp Hewa. This is a large trading post here on the coast of Bend during World War II. That's what it looks like during the war. And then since the war, sorry about that, that's what it looks like today. It's been cleared, a lot of piles of, uh, of debris. And unfortunately, that is the case. Sometimes you get to a site and it no longer resembles what it was. Maybe it's a new subdivision. Maybe it's your local Walmart. Maybe the USO was knocked down and that came from a bank. Or maybe just maybe, like I showed you, some of those sites are still there and we've got them. But what this does, whether it's still there or not, shows us the change in our state over the past six and a half decades. So, let's look at some of the other posts around the state. Camp Bowie went up in 1940, prior to U.S. involvement in World War II. Check the time there. What remains? Not much, because the city made most of the post business part. But what does remain is an activity center that they're working with on the National Register. And this mural that you see here was painted by a cooperation with both Army soldiers and German POWs. And you see some of their artwork around the state, the POW things. How about Fort Clark? Fort Clark is in King County in between San Antonio and Del Rio, for those of you that are aware of that portion of our state. It's a powder post dating back to the 1800s that threw uh, World War II trained troops. In this case, they had the only all African American. Cavalry Division training in the United States during World War II, and that was the second cavalry. This is them getting off the trains, getting ready to get on their trucks and move towards the post. This is kind of that example that we're making today. We were working with our sister agency, Texas Department of Transportation, that worked on buying some roads, and they gave me a phone call and they know about army bunkers in Kitty County. And at first I thought, well, I seriously doubt that they decided to dig in a line of defense in Kane County for anything invading from the Pacific. But when we got there, we found out that they were actually using dismounted cavalry techniques and fighting from fixed positions and fighting to take fixed positions. And in some cases, this pillbox, you can see the opening area right there, still exists today. This is their POW camp, housing over 3,000 POWs in, the, in that camp during World War II. A lot of temporary buildings there. They weren't made to last more than 20 years. A lot of them didn't last that long. And uh, as, a, as an example today, most of it's gone. I'll give you another example of things being gone. If you went up to the northeastern edge of our state, towards Smith County, the city of Tyler, right here is the 1943 and the 1995 areas. They're showing different ranges. This is a gunner range, the other one is either a gunner range or a grenade range. And this opening right here and down here are parts of the post. Well, what happens in the 1950s is the highway system is built up all over our state, and you can see the inset right there being that one, and that inset being right there. That's I-20 going right across the top of the camp. You see that on Pyatt in West Texas, the Pyatt right there. How about talking about the home front industries? We can talk as small as the Ruben Manufacturing Company, Schumer, that made shovels prior to World War 
II, but they've got an army contract to build level frames for backpacks during the war. You can talk about Pantex of the Indian Panhead, where they assembled and put together munitions. This is an aerial showing the munition facility where they put together at various bunkers, where they would store them. And of course, classic images of civilian workers putting together artillery shells, putting together tank shells, supporting the work here in the state. How about chemicals and tools for the American Scene Company up in the Panhandle, Dumas, northeast of the town. This is a uh, 1943 aerial showing the camp working, smelting. Okay, there's some that's still there today. It's closed, of course, means it's a massive environmental cleanup site as you can possibly imagine. But there's these types of sites all over the state. In Dallas, you have various manufacturing plants. Let me show you each one four plant in a second. But because of the lines, you may not be able to see it. This is a long assembly line, and they're building P-51 Mustangs in Dallas during World War II from one of the best combat planes that the United States put out for its Army Air Forces and its Marine pilots during the war. If we go over to East Texas, a community called Orange, they build stores and destroyer escorts, minesweepers, various types of ships. They have many different shipyards in the bend of the river right here. City of Orange is here. We're going to talk about this subdivision right here. These are close up of the shipyards. They would build ships there, give them to the Navy, they would take them out to the Gulf, and they go to war either in the Pacific or the Atlantic. Well, in 1942, the community of Orange is about 6,000 people, give or take a few hundred, depending on what their last uh, count was. By 1943, so many people had come to this community looking for jobs that it's ballooned over 40,000 workers. They're trying to work and they're, they're succeeding it. They're building a lot of ships, but they're living in anything they can. They're living in cars, they're living in rooms, they're living in tents. So the government decides we're going to build a massive housing complex next to the shipbuilding yards. And you may have heard this kind of stuff for Kaiser and the shipbuilding on the West Coast and established shipyards back on the East Coast. But we had it here in Texas as well. City of Orange is right here, and they built the Riverside Housing Banks. This is what it looks like. As you can see, no trees. This is put up fast and quick. They cleared the land, and they had everything from community centers to schools and churches and plenty of, plenty of roads and parking for our American cars during the war. And it's right there next to the shipping industry. So around the clock, three shifts a day, workers can keep working and walking back and forth to the plant. Now, I've got this photo right here to give you the view of the next photo. This is what it looks like today. World War II, 1942 especially, losing the war, trying to find a way to hold as much as possible and then take the offensive on against the Axis nations. This community was put together quick and the infrastructure wasn't up to code. So sitting in the after the war, you can see what happens. Now when we came down here, Mr. Ford took us on a nice boat tour, saw some dolphins, and he also uh, brought us to attention this plant here. It's one of the sites I want to talk to him about local industry in this county during World War II, not just in the southern part of the county, but the north as well. Now let's focus on another aspect, our oral history workshops. We've been doing these oral history training workshops around the state because over 750,000 Texans served during World War II. That's both men and women. And two times two that number for the amount of soldiers that came into our state and trained here and civilian workers that were here. Native born Texans or came to Texas for a job. And then you add on to that the number of children. One oral historian is not going to make it around Texas in time to get everybody's oral history. So what we've been doing is oral history training workshops around the state, trying to give people free training on how to do oral histories. I got a handout there for you if you want it before you leave today to go with the Texas World War II workshop. But often is the case, much like we are today, except set up in the classroom setting, is our oral history workshops. This photo right here is us in this building in August conducting our workshop talking about how to do oral history, the research with it, equipment, how to transcribe, how to preserve it, and how to say that regardless of what the story was, every story is important. So I better work here. Use an example right here. L.D. Cox, children served on the USS Indianapolis. How many of you have ever heard of the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis? Quite a few, a lot more than you have heard of Eagle Pass. That's okay. <laughs> Well, he's serving on the USS Indianapolis. It's a heavy cruiser that fought off the shore of Iwo Jima, and he witnessed the flag raising and the second flag raising on Mount Surfach. He can talk about that in history. He talks about 
serving off the shore of Okinawa and being damaged by an attack and being sent back to San Francisco and picking up a special cargo and taking that special cargo back across the Pacific as fast as they could in August of 1945. Well, he said his fellow sailors had rumors that it could be anything from food to General Carver's favorite toilet paper. Turns out to be the atomic weapon he used. And unfortunately, after they delivered the, the weapon, his ship was sunk. And many of the men on that ship died both from going into the water from the sinking and also from shark attacks. Now, we have an opportunity to do a little history with him. And we talked about various aspects of his service, not just the sinking of the ship. And he did a great example of talking to us about what it was like to have that different perspective. Now, when you think of the flag raising on Mount Suribachi, a lot of people often think of seeing a second flag raising taking place up on top of the volcano. But there are so many different perspectives. How about the Navy fighter pilots flying over the island, looking down and seeing that flag on top of the hill, or in this case, the volcano? Or the Navy pilots, knowing our men have gotten that far? How about from across the island, the Japanese perspective of that flag raising? Or how about memory since then? Harlan Lock, one of the men in the back photo, is from Westerville. This is a uh, museum there that has a painting put in 1959 in the local post office, his uniform, very flag and black, talking about his service during World War II. And what we try to teach with those World History Training Workshops is, doesn't matter what your perspective was, it's unique and it's first person. And if you have the opportunity, do give someone an opportunity to do World History. Whether you fought in Iwo Jima, whether you were a civilian worker, men, women, and children in World War II, there are so many different stories that we can talk about. We can talk about the home front. Got a friend who's got four boys. This old one is 15 years old. He loves history. Not a big fan of doing his math or science, but he loves history. He's looked at this photo up here in the top left and he's asking, William, I don't understand which cities in Texas were bombed during World War II. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they're clearing up the rubble from the streets like they did in Europe after the bomb. I said, no, that's a scrap truck. 14 year old, 2010, not knowing what a scrap truck is. Let's fall down here. But you find a 14 year old that lived in World War II and did their old history, we can tell you a lot about what it was like. How about the people on the home front going through rationing, using their own sugar, their flour, and their time? put together cakes, to put together donuts for servicemen at USOs. Like this policy. They're not going out to Walmart and buying it real quick. They're giving up their ration to do something for you in hopes that possibly someone in another community is doing that for their son or their daughter's training. Those are great home front stories. You can talk about that as well. You can talk about the unique things that the community did. Port Francis did many unique things. This is Kerbin. What are they doing here? They're doing a knickknack drive. They're putting together watches, coins, anything, any kind of little trinket that they can put in packages and mail to the county's men serving overseas that they can use as trading items with people in the county while they're overseas. And a little way of saying, hey, this is home. And what talks of home more than having to leave it or leave your kids? Got a little daughter, she's 17 months old. She's in daycare five days a week. And that just seems normal to me. But in 1942, when so many families had grown together to deal with the Great Depression, and cousins and uncles and grandparents were all living together, they could watch a kid if mom or dad got a job. But if dad's gone to war, if mom's gone to war, if one of them, like this classic Rosie the River photo shows, has got a job, in this case orange, who's going to watch the kids? Especially if they move to another community to get that job. Well, you see the growth of daycare. All these different aspects of our social history that have changed. Now, if you want one, before you leave today, we have for you our free Texas World War II Fundamentals of Military World History. It gives you the bare bones basics of how to do world history, and it also shows you that before and after photo example we're trying to get. We've got a bike here at the front, and if you want, you should walk out, or we'll be happy to give one to you. But as we move around the state and we document science, we document both. Military and public work. I told you I'd show you another map about those people in the camps. But it took a long time to work with. Okay, I've got about five more minutes and then I'll finish up and be able to take some questions. You got the base camps, the larger camps. Camps that count somewhere from a thousand to three thousand enemy POWs and usually were associated with some sort of army, navy, 
or our armed forces folks. But you also have the smaller camps, the branch camps. And I'll put these photos back up and we can talk about them. You have questions about them. Okay, which camp is that? But these were often camps that the local community said, we need labor in our community to harvest the trees or to pick the potatoes because so many men and women have gone overseas. And we mark that in Buffett with the POW camp there. And Roth Hammer in 1944 put his initials on the stones at the front entrance of that camp. Or in Camp Huntsville in Walker County, where you see this flower bed right here. Unfortunately, that's all that remains today. So if you're not doing this all history, you don't understand. If you don't have a city like Cumberland that's done a lot of research on their own to talk about their story in World War II, or we'll talk about the women of World War II and how they served both in the home front and the military. But we could call Poppy, a Texan from Houston, highest ranking female officer during World War II. Or how about more of those military sites? Some of you are tourists when you go to other communities. How many have been out to the West Texas desert to see the Martha Lines? Two hands? All right. I'm pretty sure it's the Chamber of Commerce out there. Five slides, but don't tell them I said that, okay? <laughs> but if you're looking from the tech stop, you would say, to look how the powerful lights are. This is what you're missing on. All of our army on the which is still there. The buildings are just raised. Dedicated to Marco there in 2007, and this is the most expanded resource left. But what did this site do for the men that came to Texas to train? And what did it do for the community? Well, that's how the World War II. Uh, program comes to play. It talks about our allies from Turkey, from Brazil, from England and Canada, from Mexico. They came to our state to train, not too far from here, Victoria County, where the Mexican Expeditionary Air Force trained. Also, you know about Japanese American relocation on the West Coast of American citizens? Well, during the war, in four camps in Texas, we have enemy alien detainees from Italy, Germany, and Japan. Again, the POW camps are separate from these types of camps. And if you are good with computers and like to play around, go to Google Earth tonight. Uh, sorry, not Google Earth. Go to YouTube tonight and type in Crystal City Family Internment Camp. And you are going to get a color video that shows you what life was like in that camp. You're going to see the children playing. You're going to see the Zavala County Sheriff and his deputies riding patrol around the fence line. We dedicated Martin there to talk about this subject in the other camps. We talked about how Texas was a springboard for the double V, victory both of the Axis, axis overseas, but also against racial discrimination back home. American GI Forum, working for Latino rights, or manufacturing. I told you about the P 51s, the big B 24 plant, which is still in operation today. They don't have a whole line of B 24s in there anymore. They haven't even got a 35 joint strike fighter, and I don't have a photo to show you because they wouldn't let me take a photo of that. But we talked about the Navy sites. How auxiliary fields, I showed you the photo of, uh, of the Sweetwater auxiliary field, the WASP practicing. I showed you the Eagle Pass Army Air Field of it being a pastor. In some cases, these auxiliary fields became their own naval air stations after the war, such as Kingsville. We've talked about manufacturing, we've talked about zinc and raw materials. What do you think about Texas when you think about raw materials? How did oil, the big inch in the little inch from East Texas, all the oil produced from our state during the war? And you also talk about great change after the war. The Victory Grill opened on BJ Day. During the war, African Americans were not allowed to go to the same way so as the canteens. In many cases, not all, in many cases, as their fellow white, Latino, sometimes Asian, backgrounds. One gentleman in Austin opened a Victory Grill on the picture of Japan in August 1945 so that they would have that opportunity. Now, we're talking as much as we can, but there's a lot that still remains. This is a huge bomber field in West Texas called High Army Air Field. During the war, it's trained many men on many different planes. This is the most extended resource available today. So much of it is the spirit of the state. And what we're hoping is when we have done all these 1,500 sites across the state, you can go to our website, which looks like this. You'll get a map, and with my really cool PowerPoint special effects, you'll move your cursor across the pop on a part of your state, in this case Madagor Island, you'll see a sort photo of what Madagor Island or whatever the site may be looked like during the war if we can get one. This is another one, the one on the peninsula, but also what they look like today. Plus, information in the database that if you want to read more about it, we have listed the books we know about it, the historical associations that have archives, the dissertations written about it, the website links, everything in one place that the history buff, public school teacher, and academic historian can come to. 
and get the resources they need to want to teach in school, but they're just curious about where did Grandpa serve in Texas during World War II. So if I can, I want to leave you with the urgency of this mission. We've talked before with the little workshop we've done here in the ones we've done around the state, that sooner or later, those that served during World War II are not going to be able to tell us the stories of their experience, whether that was the military or on the front. And after that, we're going to lose the stories of the children. What was life like? How did it affect them growing up during the Cold War? In this case, scrap drives is an example. But I want to leave you with two examples we use to tell the difference in the children's experiences. The boy you see right here on the left, his name is Richard Don Sims. This one was taken at Christmas in 1944 in Fort Worth, Texas. His father is a sailor on the aircraft carrier USS Franklin. Three months later, the Franklin in the Pacific is going to be attacked by kamikazes, and his dad's going to die saving other men on that ship. Richard Don Sims has spent his life keeping alive for his family members and anyone interested in the history of his dad and the men of Benjamin Franklin. In addition to the right, these two little girls and their parents. This is the family mugshot of a lady who was nice enough to do a little history of you and me and what life was like in those alien internment camps, in this case, Crystal City, being a Costa Rican German whose nation decided that her dad, being a German immigrant, may be a threat to their country and shipped them off to the United States. This was the case for Peruvians and other Central